Let's see who's sponsoring tonight's Hazmat Guys Roundtable. Hazmat 101 Consultants. Hazmat 101 Consultants and their instructors can provide quality consulting and virtual or in-person hazardous materials training for your agency. Owner and lead instructor, Bob Cascignano, is also available for lecturing at your fire or hazmat conference and has in fact done many speaking engagements across the country. Visit their site at www.hazmatconsultants.com or email Bob Cascignano at bob at hazmat101consultants.com. For over 20 years, k &R plaques have had the pleasure of helping clients choose awards for the people they want to honor. Their state-of-the-art equipment allows clients to design, customize, and personalize the awards they choose for that special someone. With one of the largest selections of plaques, awards, trophies, and clothing apparel, they can deliver quality products to satisfy any customer needs. No order is too big or too small. Visit their website at www.knrplax.com or email at sales at knrplax.com. Responder Training. RTE is the leading company in delivering propane training along with emergency response equipment. Responder Training has many propane flaring kits, water injection kits, accessories, and replacement parts available. They also sell the only commercially available one inch propane flare kit appropriately named the Dragon Slayer, because size does matter. Contact our good friend, owner instructor, Ron Huffman, for more information. You can reach him at 765-524-4848. You can email Ron at respondertraining.rdh.gmail.com or peruse his website at respondertraining.com. Northeast Hazmat has your supplies for leaks, easy vac pumps, stingers, hoses, rupture seals, and now carrying fire blankets and hazmat apparel. If you'd like to sponsor the show and help keep live hazmat conversations coming in the future and help send at least one lucky participant to a national level hazmat conference, send an email to bob at the hazmat and he'll send you the information. Thanks a lot. Now on with the show. Hey, everybody. Hey. Right. Hi. Welcome to another exciting episode of the Hazmat Guys uh, Roundtable featuring... Oh, oh my word. It's an old-timey <laughs> phone. Hello, operator. So, <laughs> so much stock. That? So much ah. stock. <laughs> we're, we're still on a landline over here at the Zintec household. Oh, I got with bells oh. and everything. <laughs> hey, folks. <laughs> <laughs> gotta you gotta wind it up and everything. That's great. Jesus. Sarah? <laughs> That's great. Sarah? Can you get me? Can you get me the barber? Hello, operator. <laughs> operator. Oh, oh, Lordy Lord. We are we're doing things. Yesterday was my favorite holiday. April Fools. <laughs> oh my let me just say for so everybody in the world. Oh my God! <laughs> so we're not doing the fentanyl awareness class for the youngsters? No, oh. no, no, no. Damn what, it! What about the butt hut? The bu bio bubble <laughs> butt hut. The, yeah, I mean, we could we could leave that anywhere. That was uh, that was a funny one. Um, I'm gonna share it in the chat. Uh, the the fake URL that we put up, and it's amazing. Um, thanks to Camilla and the gang putting that up whole bunch of stuff in there so funny um <laughs> some really funny ones in there that, that tickled my uh fancy yeah we definitely had a good time i got some that. kind of thing a bunch of hazmat people wanting to date me or something i don't the... yeah <laughs> yeah well i mean you've been to the conferences you know how competitive <sighs> the market is you know <laughs> <laughs> it's very competitive. You got to get a leg up. You got to get a leg up. It's you know, uh, lefty, oh, easy, righty. We'll have to say. Right, right. Good stuff. So, what have you guys been up to? I was just with you guys in uh, in Massachusetts, which uh, I, you know, times. let me let me be the the first of many to say uh, to that Jen and Travis Rebella did a 
phenomenal job. Oh, spectacular. Um, it was, uh, you know, it was at a football stadium. So they literally took the football and ran with it and they did a fantastic job. So big props to you guys and all and everybody that helped out with them. It was a new venue at Gillette stadium. Amazing. And it was very cool. Very cool. Amazing. I was excited because we were going through some vintage stuff to give away. And I happened to come across a, a, an old t-shirt. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> I got that. I meant to, wear, <laughs> damn it. I meant to wear it tonight and I forgot. Damn it. Little known fact. Yeah. Jay-Z was the great, great American, American hero. hero. Great American oh, hero. Yeah. Oh. yeah. Hey, we all need a side job. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And his hair is I'm, still luscious. Yeah. I'm going to wear that at the bar in Baltimore, I think. <laughs> oh, yes. Wear it, ra- wear it proud, you know? Oh, without a doubt. I love right it. Right on. Right on. I, um, we, are, we are going to go through a timeline tonight. Now, I will say I am not familiar with this incident, uh, I, I but I know we kind of are. Some people are a little bit more than others. Um, something that is called the Silver Ridge Explosion, which is in Loudoun Town. Is that right? Loudoun, Virginia? Loudoun. Loudoun. Loudoun, Loudoun County, oh. of Virginia. And we, we actually had God coming on. through. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder, can people hear him? I wonder if they can hear him. Can, does anybody hear the director when, when we talk? All right. Well, it would be funnier if they could. <laughs> <That'd be so laughs> <funny. laughs> um, all right. So how do we want to do this? How do we want to do this? I have the timeline. Uh, I have the news article. I have some pictures. I know Ben, our director, is going to be uh, putting up some stuff at certain points. Um, but I guess I, I, I'll kind of narrate it a little bit. No, they can't hear it. Oh, there we go. So there is the, the house in question. Um, right there in the middle. I, what is it? Three forty-seven Cedar Ridge Road Boulevard, which I don't the think is the actual. House? Yeah, yeah I, okay. I don't. I don't. And I'm not sure if that is exactly the corner house. Yes. Oh, it is. It, it definitely is. is. Yes. Oh my God, he's making a flight. Is he in a drone right now? He's amazing. Wow, what a guy! How does he do that? He, he's magic. So it turns out that at seven thirty-eight p.m. Uh, let me find out when exactly this was. This was, what was the date on this? February 19th of this year. Um, it turns out that two crews, engine 618 and truck 611 from the Sterling Volunteer Fire Department, were dispatched to investigate a smell of natural gas outside the home of 347 Silver Ridge Drive. All right, so just, I, I, know, I think I'm the only... I, uh, Mike, are you still in the volleys, or are you kind of? Uh, I was. I kind of punched out. Okay, so I, I can say at seven thirty-eight p.m., they're probably riding decently staffed. I, I'm totally guessing on that, but I'm saying they probably have what a, a normal engine and truck have in a city. Yeah, probably I mean, about you can see guys, five or six or seven. You can see plenty of personnel standing on scene just in the in this explosion picture. Right, but I'm saying you know on on arrival, there's probably not a, a you know thirty or forty or fifty people. They usually all, all the looky loos come afterwards. The guys come to cut the crumb cake and you know help with ground ladders and jazz like that. So <laughs> yeah, the whistle I'm goes thinking, and you had a, a probably eight nine people showed up at the house and then went. Hmm. I'm thinking the first response, which was an engine and a truck, were probably five to six people total. Right. And it says, so the initial alarm came in at 738. They were on the road within three minutes, which is pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. That's respectable. That's that's respectable for a city. So that's really good. Guys in the fire. So um, arriving reports. Now, they they took them 13 minutes to get there. Arriving units took a report of leaking in-ground propane tank outside the home. Now. Propane tanks are usually the larger versions, right? When you have them in the ground. Yes. Yes. It can be. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Probably okay. five hundred gallons. Okay. I don't know. Ron. Ron could probably. Um, Ron's on. He could probably uh, 
chime in on that one. Yeah, I, we're in a little bit of a delay, so Rob, Ron will probably give us the answer in a couple of seconds, and we'll I'll throw it in as soon as it pops up. Um, so at 8.15, which is about 20 minutes after they get on scene, um, the dispatcher asked for a status report, and they respond. Engine 618 responded with, we've located a 500-gallon exterior propane tank that is leaking still investigating ah look at that that's wow that's a big boy that is big was this buried in the ground maybe i'm jumping ahead i'm sorry so they they found the tank they found it in the ground okay oh okay so that's kind of what yeah that that that's yeah not that's not the tank that would be a little creepy if the guy was actually standing next to it. Oh, look at this thing. I'm going to blow this thing up. Uh, but, yeah, that's kind of like uh, one of the tanks, uh, one of the types of tanks. At 8.17, two minutes after Engine 618 gave that report, they escalate the incident requesting hazmat and a second engine crew. And they say that the leaking tank has 100 gallons of propane, which I'm going to guess – that they talked to the homeowner and they deduced that. Well, I, I, I can probably chime in on that. I know what happened on that one. Uh, oh, please. They came out, uh, the propane company came out to fill the tank. They got about a hundred gallons in there and they realized it was leaking and oh. they called their supervisor and this supervisor said, don't, don't, don't fill it anymore. Just we'll deal with it later. I read that somewhere in, one of the reports. Uh, so they had, uh, they, they knew it was leaking. Um, and the, the, the propane tank only serviced the pool. That's the only thing it serviced. Didn't service. Wow, the wow. Yeah. I can see it looks like it's warming up the pool now. That's a, uh, that's a jacuzzi. A, as they said. <laughs> yes. A hot tub. Yes. Yes. So, <laughs> it, and it, it was off to, uh, I don't know it was off to one of the sides, I believe, because, uh, they, they didn't, they, they didn't know exactly which house had the propane tank. So I think oh. they went to one of the, uh, either the, the Bravo or Charlie house first. Oh, to, wait, so my wait. Understanding. So hold on. So the propane delivery people were like, it's leaking and they just punched out. Like they didn't stick around to be like, Hey, this is the house and the tank. Uh, like, that th I don't these know. Are, these are two separate moments. They arrived because of I, an odor of gas, but the propane company was there previously. I, I don't, I don't know that for a fact. I am not really sure uh, when they, I don't know the timeline of when they filled the tank. Okay. And, and and I'm assuming it was way before that because I doubt they'd be out there at 7.30 at night. Right. However, I don't know that. Uh, and I can't remember. I read that somewhere. I can't remember where I read that, uh, unfortunately. What a shitty yard that you got a triangle, man. How are you going to play football or something back there, too? All right. So I'm just I'm just doing a little, <laughs> Not <laughs> I'm doing a little CSI uh, bit here. In the top corner of the pool by the house, there's a white kind of round object. Could that have been the 500-gallon tank? Right? Yeah, right. Go to the right, Mr. Director. A little bit more. Up, up, up. To the left. Right that, Right in there. Is Yeah, right there. I wonder if that's the tank or a walkway. It's hard to tell. Interesting. Well, I mean, if it's underground, it's underground. I, I would think it's yeah. probably, um, buried you know, or something. Yeah. To, yeah, it's probably it's probably buried. Um, so engine at eight seventeen, they reported that they have a hundred gallons of propane. Okay, at eight eighteen, they establish command, and f in preparation for a l prolonged response, and a battalion chief is now called in to lead the operation, and within. <sighs> Six minutes, Battalion Chief 601 is en route. He's requesting information about the propane tank. Say, seconds later, at 824, the home explodes. We just had a catastrophic explosion, a unit reports from the scene. That is followed by mayday calls from two firefighters trapped in the basement of the home. I'm in the basement, trapped by debris, one report. 
And at 826, only two minutes after the home explodes, work begins to account for the crew members, which that's great to conduct a par within two minutes of an explosion. That's yeah. on it. Yep. I agree. Wait, they were in they were in the basement of the house that exploded and exploded from propane. I don't the, I don't know uh, if they were in the basement, but Ron Ron Huffman's chiming in and he said that the uh leaking underground can follow any line into the structure, which is one hundred percent true. Yep. At utility lines, fissures, any yep. any breaks in the soil. Yeah. Uh, so I think I I listened to the um, audio on this. Uh, it's pretty long, but I only listened for maybe the first 10 minutes. And you're right, Mike and Bobby, they, you know, they did, they requested a par right away, which was great. But what I thought was interesting is the one who gave the par is he, he announced very quickly that they had a DOA in the front yard. So I don't know no. where that guy was whether he was in the structure, got blown out, or was entering the structure, got blown out, or what. But then the other two guys were actually in the basement. But I don't, uh, you know, like Bob says, they could have been on, uh, they could have been on an upper floor, or right. they, and they could have been down there. Who, who knows? But I, they were trapped in the basement, yeah. Was it a DOA of an MOS? Was it a member of service? Did, did No, it was, was the, this a it it was the fire captain. Uh, I think he's. I think he was the captain. Um, okay. Uh, yes, it was. It, so, I'm thinking because when I was listening to that, I thought, "Wow, they didn't even pull him out. They didn't even pull him out." And but but when they they discovered him in the front yard, and they declared him nine oh one right there. Wow. Uh, which so it must have been. It was probably severe, you know, trauma. Yeah. Uh, yeah and then there were three guys in the basement total but you could hear two guys on the radio talking which one guy was um he he was he was getting get me out the other guy was like i'm just gonna hang here until you guys get me um understandably yeah, they, they're you know they're sitting on a bunch of debris but uh it was pretty interesting if you could dig up the the um the audio it's pretty pretty interesting um jason gore who is i believe in virginia or in that zone he says the count combo county with career responders supplemented with volunteers he says from what i understand he was going in the structure might have been hit by the pressure wave yeah mm. huh? yeah wow so a little bit more of the uh, of the wording um the home explodes. We've had a catastrophic explosion. The unit responds. That is followed by media calls of two people. Okay, so 826. Work begins to account. It is the par. Engine 611 arrives on scene and reports. We've had a house explosion. Significant damage. The house is pretty much leveled. Another media is heard. I'm trapped in the basement. Can somebody get me out? Two minutes later, Battalion Chief 601 arrives on scene. He quickly calls for the Rapid Intervention Task Force and a second alarm for more manpower confirming people trapped in the basement and a large pile of debris everywhere. We're, go we're going to work on getting the firefighters out of the basement. This is communication. One minute after that, the death of one firefighter is confirmed. Now, I, just to put that in perspective, I want to pull this back to where we were. Is 824 home explodes, 829, the death of one firefighter is confirmed. Hmm. He was later identified as Trevor Brown, the 45-year-old volunteer. An EMS task force is, is requested to bring ambulances and medics to the scene. Okay. Mm. 831. I want to keep it in kind of, you know, how far it is yeah, from yeah. the explosion. Another call is heard from a firefighter trapped in a basement. I'm trapped in a basement on the heavy debris. I'm in a blind space. However, I've got fire going on down here, and it's slowly waking, making its way towards me. I'm unable to make my way out. I need you guys to get down here and put this fire out ASAP. So... That's interesting now because I, if there's a fire making its way to him, you can. I'm making the assumption. I'm not Monday morning quarterbacking, but after an explosion, I'm going to say for the most part, the propane's gone. 
Yeah. 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 Right. I mean, you could. Yep. I guess you could theoretically say, well, you could still have whatever was leaking into the Pockets. house, continuing to leak into right. the house. Right. Right. <clears throat> but if if we had an explosion, and now again, we 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 don't know if it was a, and I would say, I can reasonably assume that it was not a blevy because it was underground, which is an enormous heat sink. So it was not a. Um, I'm gonna guess a container failure. No. I'm gonna guess it was a gas leak. That hit an ignition point source, yeah. Right. yeah so, it was, because if you look at the debris, the debris looks scattered even 360. So the pressure wave didn't come from one side and push the house to another. That came from in from the inside out. Right. Yeah. I so, would say it was an accumulation, probably in the basement, and it just had it been going for a while. It accumulated, and there was some ignition source, which could be just about anything it could be right. a light, light switch being turned on it could be shuffling across carpet it could be dropping a tool it could be a lot of different stuff and and, and so with that being said with a in tank uh, intact tank that's still holding propane could that fire be propane driven or could it be um com typical class a combustibles or class b whatever the hell it is marching towards him could be both. I I think at this point you can, you, you could are. I mean, I I guess I would venture to go more towards Class A if I'm if the information is correct that it only serviced the the pool and the heater for the pool wasn't up against the house. Then I would venture to say you probably don't have a constant flow going into the house. Uh, it would be the whatever the seepage is from the leak. But I mean. I, how would you even he couldn't have heard it his ears must have been pretty messed up you got to be able to i guess see that that fire is growing near you and around you yeah that's i'm just i'm i'm trying to put myself in the situation and kind of like imagining you know if you have a fire pushing across you even from the incident commands what are you going down there with are you going down there with a foam with water are you going down there with, uh, you know, uh, dry extinguishers in a class C type thing? I I'm just thinking out loud. So here's another thing. Uh, in the in the audio, one of the guys or both of the guys, I don't remember, but one of them specifically said, you need to stop flowing water because it's 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 coming up around me. And so oh. so he, the problem was is that, yeah, the fire's coming, but they're not necessarily – hitting the seat of the fire they're flowing water and right. it's, it's filling up yes it's filling up so he was he was he was kind of like hey put the fire out but don't try not to put any more water in here don't drown me yeah exactly so, exactly so i'm gonna assume then he was actually in the basement when it went off i i because how else are you not on top of debris well th this what jay-z just said is almost carbon copy and mike would remember this but probably nobody else will is the father's day fire in new york city uh which happened june 11th of 19, 2001 20. right before 9 11 and there was three firefighters killed one of them being brian fahey who was on the first floor of a uh of a what we call a taxpayer it's a storefront and um in the basement there was one pound um propane cylinders pallets of them because the guy got on them on a deal and when they blew up, they displaced the floor right up, and he went into the basement. And without getting too graphic, that is exactly what happened to him, um, that they they just turned the deck guns on the building, and that's how he went. So, oh, wow. wow. Yeah, so, like, it, I could definitely see it. If you think about a basement, it's a reverse bathtub. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know that's exactly what it is. It, it, it is, you know, it meant to keep the water out as opposed to the bathtub keeping the water in. So, yeah, that's that's a tough one. Um, eight thirty four, ten minutes afterwards, with the fire under control, units begin digging through debris in the basement to rescue the trapped firefighters. That's pretty. That's fast, man. These guys are on it. 838, four minutes later from that last one, is contact is made with the first trapped firefighter outside. One of the fire hydrants failed forcing the crew to hook up to one further away. Preparations are made for the treatment of trauma patients, including air care, that a helicopter transport may be needed. Okay. 
Um, now at 8.42, the first tra fa trapped firefighter is rescued from the basement. Another firefighter reports he's trapped with one third of his air remaining in his breathing tank, and he's under quite a bit of debris, although he says he can't hear their communications. He tells the rescuers he's going to relax and control his breathing to conserve oxygen. Now that, that's, that's pro. Awesome. That is that's, pro. That's well, next level. I'll tell you what, when you listen to him, you're like, that guy was like sitting on a couch watching TV. He was, he was totally laid back. Uh, pretty amazing. That's training wow. at its top. We used yes. to, when I Agreed. was in the squad company, and we would train um, sitting down, SCBA, breathe it to the Vibe Alert starts, or whatever your brand is, right? And then breathe it till the Vibe Alert stops, and then see how long from when it stops to when it you, you don't have any more air. It just sucks to your face. And you'd be amazed at how much air you have after that. But right. that calming, that number of knowing that I'm under duress and I have six minutes left after the vibe alert stops, you don't get panicky and start breathing faster because you're in a mental panic. Right. right. This guy obviously did some training. Yes. Wow. He knew. Yep. yep. Yeah, he was, he was very calm. Uh, pretty amazing. I, bravo. So, I mean, not to, uh, uh, you know, Monday morning quarterback in, in any way in, in that regards, but so I'm uh, from what I'm hearing, there wasn't enough time for hazmat to get on scene. Were they, they were in, they were in the structure. Did, did they have LEL readings? Like what was, what was the atmosphere? The, the now, before we started, um, somebody mentioned that it was 74%. And I, I don't know, that is not confirmed. I don't know where I heard that, but 74% is, is quite high. Like, That's again, high. and where makes a difference right, too. And if where? If you're 74% yeah. at the crack, okay, I get it. If you're 74% <laughs> at the door, the, you know, the front door of the building before you're even in the basement, that's an issue. So I, I think how and where and when and, 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 and we don't even know if, if the first arriving unit had air monitor. You know, a lot of departments are going to that these days. And unfortunately, there's a, a huge lack of training with that. But not saying that that's the situation here, but a lot of departments don't have the first arriving unit showing up to these calls without a gas meter. Well, yeah, I so we don't, we don't know where that came from. I certainly hope you wouldn't enter a structure of a possible propane leak if, you've, if, you're, if you have no atmospheric monitoring. I, yeah, I don't know that they did that. I'm not saying that, but just, you know, there's it's 50-50. Some have them, some don't. They probably have the intrinsic safe lighter from HMAF uh, <laughs> Industries. Um, just saying. Uh, for well, you, you know, smoke. If, if, you, if you think about it, uh, and I don't know how you guys label your stuff, but when we show up to a structure, uh, we're, we're always looking for an all clear. In other words, you know, the house is clear, the structure is clear, there's nobody inside. And you can get that a lot of times from, um, you know, the bystanders or the owners of the house. They come out and say, yeah, nobody's inside, we're out. If you're going to enter a structure, what's your objective? Right. That is the right. key. Well, what this is, is your objective? This is, a, the, this is the risk reward that we talk about when we train an operations level, when we, when we talk yep. to operations level about, okay, well, how are we going to proceed? What are we going to do? What are we going to operate? That is always the first question you have to ask. Why am I doing this? Is there a reward? What is the risk? Right. Right. I, right. And if you, and if you do have a meter and you are in an atmosphere above 10%, guess what? You're you, you in violation. Should, right. You shouldn't be there. You shouldn't be there for, except for one reason, one and one reason only, yep. and that's re that's rescue. Right. But, yeah, but, if you, yep. but if you have an all clear, and it's confirmed, you know what's and, your objective after that? Right. It's. I mean, listen. Th there's. We can safety the safety the safety the safety, but at a certain <laughs> point, you know, uh, it's time to do some gangster things, right. within reason. And what I'm saying is, like, the hazmat team, who is, I, I, as far as I know, not on scene, they're the guys to do those things. Mm -hmm. the, you know, the operations level guys are the defensive. And, 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 and listen, I, it doesn't seem like they did anything wrong. I mean, the fact that 
it blew up is not a ding at them. It's just the conditions warranted that. Well, right? yeah, it, yeah. It, what it what it does is what it does is it makes you say, OK, like, you know, we talk about this when we talk about, uh, you know, uh, studying disasters for every disaster there's eight close calls so you know you can do the propane runs our our natural gas runs which we just you know within a decade had had a chief die at a, a natural gas explosion you know they 80 percent of the time there's no issue 14 percent of those times there's a small issue that we're able to deal with and one percent of the time it's catastrophic so uh -huh. we we tend not to, as a firefighter and a fire department, we tend to become a little more relaxed at, at these runs as far as what our operations are. And, and we kind of forget that risk because we've done this 50 other times and, and nothing happened. Uh, right. I'm not saying that that's what happened here, but in, in, in normal human behavior, that's what happens. Listen, that's what would happen to me all the time. I'd do something 50 times and be like, yeah, whatever. I don't have to wear, I don't have to wear my gloves when I pick up that lithium ion battery. It, <laughs> it hasn't exploded in my hands in, uh, in 50 days. I'm good to go. So yeah, it's, you know, there's a, I'm not going to say complacency. complacency. It's, it's, it's not necessarily complacency. I think it's just a, that natural human behavior to drop your guard as you do something over and over and over again. And the result wasn't bad. Well, and there was a, no, there was another incident no. for another department, um, which I'm not going to name. But the, if you listen to the PIO, the person he even said that as their meter alarmed, they started exiting the structure, and as they did, the house blew up. It's, it wasn't this incident; it was somewhere else in another part of the country, and it almost led to the training. And again, not talking about this incident specifically, that they were trained that when it beeps, then you react not watching the numbers and then reacting, which people need to also keep in mind if you do have a meter. Right. Ron brings up a really good point in the, in the, the comments. We don't know what their meters were showing. If anything, they were standing with the meters, the other side of the door, it could have been ready to go. And we need to remember that even if you do have your meters, right? Um, Bob, I'm sure you talk about this in, in class and your meter in class all the time. It, that is just what the atmosphere is at the spot that you're standing right. at. It doesn't exactly. tell you what's three feet away. It doesn't tell you what's below you. It doesn't yes. tell you what's above you. It's telling you what is right here. Meters, and that's it. And meters only tell you about a softball size of air around the tip of it. And exactly. where, don't, don't believe, oh, it's exactly so. It's not. But the point is, if you want to know what it is, like we say high, medium, and low. Okay, that's great. <laughs> so you'll see guys and they're like low to them is like knee. That's yeah. nothing. You got to think. All right. So like, I, I have a bottle here just for explain. I know we're kind of getting long in time, but there we go. So if you imagine this bottle, right. And I have a, a, a vapor in here, right. What does it do? If I have a liquid in this thing, it, f it first makes the vapor and it hits all four corners of that bottle. And then once it fills the entire bottle, it starts to go up. And once it goes to the top, it rolls over the side and runs down the side of the bottle to the table. And then it runs off the side of the table and to the floor. And so if you're metering like this, right. are you shocked you don't get a reading? Do you, what do you think? The thing's going to magically yeah. jump up into your meter? You <laughs> meter here. Right. Listen, to right. That. I have had on propane runs my the, the probe of my meter at ankle level and it was reading That's zero and a a a flame front went through my legs <laughs> because it reached a source of ignition and it was an inch and a half from the probe of the meter there was an LEL and an inch and a half higher than that there was zero LEL readings whatsoever. So, you know, it, it's, it is, it is literally right at the tip of the meter is where it's telling you. Well, and, and not to make this a big meter in class too, but think about the exterior doors. What do exterior doors have that interior doors don't have? Weather stripping. So when you're doing that metering at the door, low, medium, high, whatever, that weather stripping is, could be holding back a significant amount of product behind the door. And it's not till you crack the door or whatever that you actually find out what's going on. Now, with that being said, if you're getting 
a reading through that exterior door with the weather stripping, you got a big ass problem behind that door. Yeah. Yep. yep. Well, the, it, you know, the other thing too is, is if you, you know, when you start off, if your meter's at 7% and you take two steps and now it's at 8% and you take another step and it's at nine, guess what happens? Where, guess, guess where you're going. <laughs> guess where you're going. And unless you want to do like, I just want to see, you know, I've never seen, you know, 50% on my meter. Um, it's, unless you're that inquisitive, uh, you're, you're actually getting yourself into a jam. Uh, yeah. A couple of ways. You're, you're already in a jam. You just don't know it. Yeah. 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 So, uh, you know, that's, that's why we have that cushion because, um, you know, we've got 90% cushion basically, but you can't push it and you can't, you can't do anything inside there. You can't do any work inside a 10% or greater uh, atmosphere unless you have rescue on your mind. Right. Um, and maybe, maybe they did, maybe they didn't, maybe they didn't have, they didn't know if anybody was in there or not. I mean, you know, they, they had to do a, a you know, a search to get it all clear. Uh, who knows? We, we all know that your meter uh, LEL for the, the, the cat B doesn't work well under 16% oxygen, but there Correct. are gases with the correction factor, with the, all that stuff put into perspective that before 10%, you're at a displacement of oxygen level where you can affect readings. And it's kind of like one of those kind of yep. things where they, they, you're, you're, you're passing the ability of the LEL to read because the LO2 is going down and you're not, you're kind of in the middle of it. It's not a common thing, but yeah, but it, can ben, but it can happen. Ben, Ben Herskowitz says, don't forget the dead banding for the cat B. The dead band is three percent plus that's three percent is a lot that's a yeah. lot so just know your equipment with that kind of stuff man that, that can mean the difference and the black line uh mps center is five percent which is that's even a bigger dead band that's that's uh i didn't know that it was that big that's that's a lot so, well, I think well, that does it. Anybody else? That was, a, quick else? Little, that was a good little uh, little discussion. And again, you know, uh, thoughts and prayers of their family and everything. Uh, yeah. Hopefully, yeah, hopefully, uh, hopefully, you know, whatever lessons learned come out of this, you know, that makes everybody a little safer down the road. So, did anybody know in the comments, did those guys get their hearing back? Oh, geez. Get their. Well, he said, I I'm assuming the, the they got their eardrums blown out. There were some oh. there were some significant burns too. I, I I read somewhere as well. So unbelievable. Yep. So all right. Well, as we say every month, see we'll you see you next Tuesday. Tuesday. See you next Tuesday. Wink, wink. We'll see you guys soon. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>